one estimate says that almost 1.5% of Venezuela's gross national income has been invested in its foreign policy. To give you a comparison, China invests 0.08% of its income. Saudi Arabia doesn't come close in terms of this. Venezuela is a massive foreign aid giver, the quintessential case of the new south-to-south -south, uh, forms of aid. And nobody matches this, and one could say that this has bought Venezuela a ton of international support. Unquestionably true. But one could also say that, as Vene that um, this support that he has obtained has allowed him to basically uh, silence any possible criticism that he might receive diplomatically, exceptional, ex especially when he, for example, uh, attacks the opposition so 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 stridently uh, as he has. Um, you know, one could say he just has Petro Caribe, he has a, a very uh, strong foreign aid regime, and so the Brazils and the Argentinas and even the Chileans and the Mexicos of the world stayed quiet. But the truth is that one could also see this as a trend of the inter-American system. Um, one of the things that we have been able to do in the, in the Americas is to have a very strong regime of response whenever we see a coup. Immediately, the, 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 the legal system and even the political will to act on behalf of trying to penalize the coup gets in motion. But whenever we start to see uh, the president undermining the Constitution, uh, nothing is done in Latin America, not just in Venezuela, but in many cases. In other words, uh, we don't have a regime to defend what could very well be the next generation of assault on democracy, which is not necessarily coming from coup makers, but from the president himself or herself. Uh, um, what the case of Venezuela shows is that it's incredibly weak, and so uh, Venezuela has received a carte blanche that could be explained by the sweet generous aspect of the Venezuelan case, the money, or it could also be explained by the fact that there is a weak international regime for, for something uh, uh, like uh, defending democracy from the president rather than from coup plotter. And finally, let me say something about the resource curse. Those of you who study development, um, uh, um, and might be familiar with the term resource curse. It is perhaps in political economy one of the most um, uh, fruitful and in new type of theoretical development in the, in the 2000s. It's a very heated debate, very good studies are being produced trying to test the hypothesis that being oil or resource dependent distorts your economy or your politics, and this is a very active area. And, and one could say that Venezuela under Chavez is a very clear example. <laughs> Let me just give you one thing. I don't know how a Dutch audience feels about the fact that uh, one of the manifestations of the resource curse is called the Dutch disease. But the Dutch <laughs> disease has to do with, in economics, uh, the, uh, um, uh, when you have a boom in one commodity, it produces an overvaluation of the exchange rate which makes your other exports completely non-competitive, it makes all your imports very affordable, and so it um, destroys your export capacity and it deindustrializes you. One of the things that we observe is that in Venezuela, there was very little evidence of a Dutch disease prior to Chavez. With Chavez, and you can find it in the book, we see the Dutch disease happening almost to a perfect degree based on the predictions. In other words, you see a complete process of deindustrialization, which is the product of an over ex overvalued exchange rate and uh, a massive source of import. So, so on the question of the resource curse, um, one could see also Venezuela as an example of precisely uh, now that we're seeing fewer samples of the Dutch disease, uh, Venezuela now is a, an example of a Dutch disease that has happened even in the Netherlands. So it's less of a sui generis condition. And finally, and finally, and then I'll stop. Uh, in response to this notion of uh, the resource curse, Michael Penfold and I came up with a, uh, a bit of a theoretical response. Although we see evidence of the resource curse in Venezuela, and we believe that a lot of what has happened is the result of uh, a booming oil economy. We introduced the term 
institutional resource curse as an alternative to uh, 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 the resource curse term. And what we mean by that is the following. Most of the aspects of Chavismo that are interesting, are worth studying for us, are not the result of oil or the oil boom, but the result of a series of institutions that were created at the very beginning of the Chavez regime before the boom in oil prices started in 2003. That essentially between 1999 and the end of 2003, the regime introduced a series of political institutions ranging from the Constitution, the way that the Supreme Court was reformed, the way that the uh, Civil Code was reformed, the way that the military was reformed, the way that the Congress was reformed, the way that um, um, even the oil company was reformed, uh, that produced the platform that allowed Chavez to then use the resources that came in after 2003 in an incredibly discretionary, and to borrow from Edwin's presentation, uh, uh, um, unaccountable way. And so for us, these institutions cannot be explained on the basis of oil, and they're very much part of the explanation for the consolidation of this regime. So, look, you can read it, just to repeat, you can read it as a very sweet, generous case something that is an aberration, something that is hard to find in the region, and I would agree with that, or you can read it as a regime that has the uh, accumulation of a number of trends, some positive, many negative, of Latin American politics and even uh, politics in developing countries worldwide. Frankly, I don't care how you read it. I don't care if you read it, but how you read it, that is up to you. Thank you, thank you for your attention.